Ian is a, a, a teacher, he's an education consultant, and he's got comprehensive experience in curriculum planning and partnership development, particularly around work with 14 to 19 year olds. He's a former um, advisor as well, covering three London boroughs. He works in intervention and engagement. Um, he's a learning and skills research network convener in East Anglia. He's an NEU uh, rep for the 16 plus, 16 plus officer. Um, in fact, his CV is massive. I could go on. I'm going to cut some out. It's too long. Um, he's a member of the Social Association <laughs> National Executive. But today, Ian is going to talk about pedagogies of the working class, focusing on what he calls working class skills that have been ignored by um, and devalued by academia. Um, now, what I, Ian is going to do is going to show you a pre-filmed um, thing that the presentation is put together. He's also going to pose questions for you. So if you get a chance to answer some of Ian's questions that you'll see in his presentation, then, then please do, but we'll see how it goes. We'll pick up the conversation uh, after we've seen um, um, Ian's film today. Good, good morning all. Um, this presentation falls really into three parts. It's first of all, um, a, a short video, although when you've seen it, you might think it's too long. Second, I'd like to generate some discussion around the research project that I refer to in the presentation. And I'll ask you to kind of either put in the chat and I'll be in my email address up um, and send any ideas to me because it's, it's a, a new project that's about to start. So really looking for the involvement of people like yourselves into that. And then finally, there'll be a, a general question and answer based on um, the presentation. So whenever Peter's ready, he can press the, the play button and I'll be live shortly. Good afternoon and welcome to virtual Blackburn here in Norwich. I was really looking forward to visiting Blackburn this summer, but due to coronavirus, here I am speaking to you from Norwich. In this talk, I'm referring to skills like communication, problem solving, teamwork, and reflecting on own experiences um, and learning from them as working class skills. I'm calling them working class skills for two reasons. First, they're skills that have largely been ignored by the academic world and were totally ignored at the time I was a student. More recently, some lip service has been paid. Secondly, I'm calling them working class skills because they've been devalued by the academic system and they've been seen in various incarnations over the years as common skills, core skills, key skills, essential skills, and more recently functional skills, but in each version they have not been seen as valuable as other um, knowledge based subjects. I'd like to start my talk by showing you two photographs that I think will illustrate something that many of you will relate to as working class academics. In the first photograph you'll notice I'm looking to the right. That's a professional photograph I had taken when I was an a development advisor with the Learning and Skills Development Agency. On the other photograph, taken by my daughter, I'm looking to the left. In all the photographs I've ever had to take, I'm looking to the left, apart from a few that were taken for work. So read into that what you will. But for me, it really makes the point that as working class people in middle class professional jobs, we are not being ourselves most of the time. And that's really the basis of my argument in this talk today. Working class skills, a skills based curriculum for change. The development of skills, knowledge and general education and enrichment fortified by entitlement as its strong backbone is a long standing ambition of radical educators. Curriculum development has a crucial role to play if education is to be transformed. Alongside a customised, learner-centred model with a commitment to the Every Child Matters agenda that is generally personalised, that is what many of us have been fighting for for our working lives. It forms the heart of all learning and teaching. As Che Guevara famously said, the walls of the educational system must come down 
in order to enable educators to help transform the world for all to become a different kind of human being and strive together to make this transformation. Like most of us, my life has not been as dramatic as Che Guevara's life was, but I have all the same been fighting for the same kinds of things all this time. In this attempt at what is essentially a pedagogical history and a historical pedagogy of the significance of skills-based education over the past 40 years, when I use the term skills, I am referring to the various incarnations of government-sponsored generic skills initiatives, from common skills to core skills to the dabbling in essential skills and most recently functional skills. These normally relate to a narrow vocational curriculum but at times a broader and more meaningful curriculum has been attempted and has emerged to cross the academic vocational divide and to generate a genuine learning curriculum. While skills like problem solving, teamwork and learning skills play a crucial role in post-14 education, I agree with the argument that the notion of a knowledge-free curriculum or a content and context-free pedagogy is a manifest absurdity. As a merely basic skills version of skills development seems to be winning once again over the fuller, more developmental model of skills, comprising improving own learning, working with others and problem solving, the need for a core module on learning to learn is more important than ever. And it is this which I like to argue for in the rest of this um, paper. Some pedagogy. As a young teacher reading Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire for the first time, I saw it as a crusade for humanity and education as some kind of act of love that has enabled me to see dehumanisation both as a historical reality and as an individual experience in the lives of many of the learners that I've worked with. This informed my teaching for many years. As time passed, I saw the matter in greyer terms, but remained wedded to the view that barriers to learning are neither purely educational concerns to be addressed by teachers, nor problems to be solved by social workers. In almost all cases, they exist and continue to exist on the cusp of education and social care. As a consequence of this, I became more and more interested in the importance of learning things that can make a difference and have continued to be drawn to the idea of pursuing interests where possible and using a situation you find yourself in as your university or learning context, rather than seeking a purely academic solution to problems. In 1995, the Royal Society of Arts published 14 to 19 Education and Training, implementing a unified system of learning. This wasn't the beginnings, but it was before Tomlinson, and it brought into sharp and clearly defined focus the main issues. How can society solve the problems which it is facing? How else can industry adapt to the increasingly competitive world and the market? How else can people experience fulfilment as human beings when increased leisure opens up fresh opportunities, or indeed a pandemic affects their lives in all kinds of ways. Some history. The context in which skills-based education is, of course, one which employers wanted a workforce, which knew their place, but had enough literacy and numeracy skills to be able to follow instructions, and increasingly important in the complex British industry that needed increasing numbers of skilled workers like mechanics, clerks and accountants. The rebirth of community education in the 1960s and 1970s absorbed a more Marxist influence. Writings such as those as Gramsci and Paolo Freire developed what remains the Marxist tradition, but now in post-Gove retreat with the most regressive education policies for nearly 80 years, concluding it in a capitalist system that remains deeply unequal and globally exploitative. Marxism still offers a valuable framework of analysis which adult educators may be able to engage in and a dialogue with emergent social movement, learning to learn and developing the skills to survive, cope, and perhaps even prosper, working class skills. Clearly skills, be they termed common, core, key, functional, or anything else, need to relate to either generic learning skills or the specific learning skills relating to the subject. With learners from less traditional backgrounds, these are essentially the learning skills. Similarly, those genuine assessments for learning that have not just been state-sponsored assessment objectives aimed at perpetuating a system that required the many to fail so that the few can succeed in a system that fostered a genuine progressive curriculum. Curriculum development and delivery and assessment methodology alike need to be matched with both the appropriate skills and attitudes 
and the syllabus aims and objectives which are to see the meanings beneath the surface of a text or a situation, to understand the nature and interplay of its constituent parts, to show appreciation of what impacts on it and to make well-considered personal and critical responses. Ever since I can remember, there have been problems about the assessment of generic skills and general education aspects of vocational education, be it liberal education, general studies, communication skills, general and communication studies, social and life skills, and now personal, social and health education. If then there is nothing new about the problematic nature of assessing these transferable skills, supposedly a prerequisite for the competitive UK industrial and service workforce, why the commotion to, to the, pledge, the pages of the education press and beyond? Perhaps it is because now these core key transferable generic skills are for the first time making an impact on traditional academia as well as vocational further education. The here and now. There have certainly been a number of false starts under Labour and missed opportunities under both Labour and Tory governments to develop and bolster a meaningful skills-based curriculum with transferable skills at its spine and entitlement at its heart. As the Govian most elitist and narrowest curricula, which have hardly been a friend to progressive educators in general ends its second decade in terms of the skills agenda, in particular, presents some fresh challenges. In functional skills and English and maths subject content, published in 2018 by the Department for Education, it clearly states that subject content should be accessible and appealing to all students, regardless of ethnicity, gender, faith, disability, and sexual orientation or maturity. The 14 to 19 curriculum has been riddled with reinventions since the event of the Youth Opportunities Programme and Youth Training Scheme in the 1980s and before. But its emphasis on common core key essential skills has played a significant part in the personal learning and employability potential for many learners during that time. A foot on the ladder of employability. Those learners that are either educated from school age 14 plus or looked after children, those at risk or those in, in safeguarding and child protection me measures or with profound learning difficulties and disabilities, or who have education and health care plan, and this includes all needs for those who need additional support and funding, have been forced into this kind of curriculum. These young people, the most vulnerable in our education system and the most at risk of failing altogether, are often those most reliant on this lifeline provided through various skills development programmes. A model for present and future. As I said, curriculum development has for me always been about the development of skills, knowledge and general education that enriches. Learning to learn takes centre stage here. It's concerned with engaging in the real world and the world of work also, but perhaps less importantly. Arts and humanities are about being and becoming human. Work exists only in the context of human life. In short, skills for employment are skills for life. Culture as a defining aspect of what it means to be human. The transferable skills of communication, teamwork, problem solving and learning skills are fundamental to entitlement, enrichment, empowerment. Vitality and joy are as significant for learning about ourselves as empowering us as they are to the world of work. Next steps. Ten years ago I was involved in a project with the Learning and Skills Development Agency and the Institute of Education, University of London, looking at tackling the so-called NEAT problem of those not in employment, education or training. I would like to return to this theme now as, and ask you to join me in helping me to move to the next step of a kind of radical development of skills that will, will enable working class children and those from all kinds of deprived backgrounds to develop those kind of skills that have meant so much to so many of us and have enabled us to get to the situation where we are invited to speak at a conference entitled Working Class Academics. We've started a project with the Learning and Skills Research Network in East Anglia and supported by the National Education Union, among others, to revive some of these ideas and to develop them further. So please join me in this campaign. And um, the first stage of that is a discussion which follows this presentation. Please all look to the left. Thank you. Um, be before I um, 
open up to um, any general questions that anybody has. I would just like to um, focus on uh, one of the slides that came up during the talk, which had a blue background and which posed four questions that I'd be interested in other people's thoughts on because that's going to focus, that's going to be the focus of the Learning and Skills Research in East Anglia's um, forthcoming project. So I'm just going to put those on a screen again, if I may. What I would invite people just to have a, uh, to reflect on those four questions, if they will. Um, quite long comment type questions, and I'll just read read them out. Um, so Owen Clayton says, Ian, is there a danger that transferable skills really means transferable labour force, i.e. precarious workers need to simply accept that they will constantly be moving around in the job market for their whole careers? Right, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I, I think, Owen, there is, a, there is a real danger in transferable skills becoming um, just that. And indeed, the, the narrow definition of functional skills that exists at the moment, and which has pretty much existed in its various guises since the early, well, late 1970s and early 1980s, in its various incarnations, has always led itself to that. I do think there have been a few times, two or three times in that, 40 odd year period, sorry, that 40 year period where the, the skills have become a bit more than narrow and functional and genuinely transferable and have be become the kind of things that can influence wider human existence and life outside of just the world of work. But in the wrong hands, as they are, as they have been most of the time, certainly are at the moment, there is every danger that that's what they become. I think part of our mission as, as educators, both 14 plus and adult, and further and higher education, is to free those skills from, from the, the shackles that, that enable people like Michael Gove and really, um, the, the current um, education tree to, to narrow them further and further. Even to the point now that children can only learn to sit in the classroom and face in front. It was about the narrowest definition yet of any kind of learning skills. Thank you, Ian. Just noticed a comment there, uh, Philip Law. Do we call you Pip Law? I'm not sure on, on uh, Twitter saying um, he's tempted to teach functional skills completely, like going off piste off the curriculum. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, I'll give you. Uh, I'd love it. It's, it's, it, I mean, I've been tempted to do that many, many times. Yeah. Um, the trouble is, you're, it, like many of us, you're forced to teach to a kind of assessment framework. So what I've always tried to do is to kind of cover the, the narrow functional aspects as quickly as possible, and then then try and make those use those transferable skills to kind of branch out into more interesting areas. And I think a lot of um, a lot of the time you can work on a, a particular project that is about enhancing the skills and pursuing the interests of a of, of the learner as well. But you do have to be mindful of the assessment criteria at all times too. I'll read out. It's, it's from Suze Bentley. So it's quite long, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a read. I see a wider way of thinking and teaching as a plus for working class academics. Only realise this happens as I see it missing from my middle class colleagues. Are we as working class academics, in brackets, and yes, I'm now calling myself that as a result of the conference, <laughs> naturally more inclusive in our teaching as we've come up the hard way. That's a gr that's a great question, actually. I'd, I'd, um, I'm ho I hope to save that and um, definitely try and build it into the uh, the project we're about to embark upon. But I, I mean, as a as a quick answer, to that, I think ab absolutely yes. I think those of us that have um, come up through a world where we've not had a traditional route into the system, where we have had um, imposter syndrome, which has come up quite a lot in this conference so far, a, a big part of our uh, feeling. Certainly I have. I mean, I can remember I graduated uh, with a good honours degree in as early as 1982. Um, and I was I, up until the age of about 50, I regularly had a dream, um, a recurring dream that my um, degree was, was not real and that I was going to be called before some kind of board to explain myself and how I'd managed to con everybody into giving it to me. Um, I, funnily enough, I stopped having that dream about eight years ago, suddenly. So. Um, I'm not sure what happened in the meantime, but I'm, I'm, I feel that we've got a, we can support other learners from backgrounds in a way that middle class colleagues 
cannot. And that, and that, that is a strength. And I think have been times, certainly in further education um, and in higher and in parts of higher education that are delivered through further education colleges and the, the post-1992 universities, where that is also the case. So yes, very, I really um, echo that sentiment. What, there, there is a there is one more question, but if we possibly haven't got time to come to Judy's question, so um, we'll do that. Perhaps you can reply to her in the chat or something like okay. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Now.